The challenge of the Yukon. <laughs> it's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. <laughs> Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. The team was fighting its way through a blizzard. But when King slowed down and started to bark, the sergeant knew there was some other reason than the difficulties of the trail. Oh, King! Oh, yes. uh. King was barking at two mounds of white at the side of the trail. The sergeant unharnessed him and he ran toward them. As he did so, a dog's head appeared from one of the mounds. Crouched close to the ground, he had been completely covered by the snow. There was no sign of life from the other mound. When the sergeant brushed the snow away... A man, King. Dead. Quickly, he examined the body. Not exposure. As a bullet killed him, a bullet in his back. The husky, who still crouched at his master's side, looked up into the sergeant's face. You've been guarding him, haven't you, old fellow? I think you'd have stayed here until the cold got you. The sergeant went through the man's pockets. His papers identified him as John Taylor. There was no gold or money. Murder. And the motive, robbery. Not a single clue. Old Faithful, I wish you could talk. <laughs> that was how Old Faithful was named. And he proved that he deserved the name. When John Taylor was buried in the Dawson Cemetery, the dog refused to leave the grave. And either the sergeant or one of the constables brought him food every day. But the murder of John Taylor was never solved. The storm had wiped out every clue. It was just about the time the sergeant gave up all hope of finding a clue that Old Faithful decided to give up his vigil in the cemetery. He followed the sergeant and King home to headquarters. He visited the cemetery every day, but it was plain that he had adopted the sergeant as his new master. The sergeant tried him out with his team and was pleased with the results. You've been well trained, Old Faithful. You're a good worker. How on you travel with us, boy, wherever we go. The next day, the sergeant was called into the inspector's office. You sent for me, Inspector? Yes, Sergeant. Sit down. Yes, sir. Take a look at this $20 bill. Huh. What do you think of it? Counterfeit? Yes, but an extremely good counterfeit. Where did it come from? This one was passed at the Monte Carlo. Half a dozen of them have shown up at the bank during the past week. The bill is good enough to fool anyone but an expert. You believe there are more in circulation? I'm sure of it, Sergeant. Well, we can educate all the businessmen in town. We shall, and we'll question anyone who tries to pass one of these bills. But I have a letter here that may lead directly to their source, the counterfeiters themselves. Do you know Gold Ledge? Well, I know where it is, sir. I've never been there. That's what I thought. That's good. You don't know the town, and the town doesn't know you. I'm suggesting that you work out of uniform while you're following up this lead. If a member of the force were to settle down in Gold Ledge for any length of time, it would alert our suspects, perhaps make it impossible to get the necessary evidence against them. You have the names of some men? Two names, Rostov and Markham. This letter is from the banker in Gold Ledge. His name is Sam Harvey. A few of the counterfeit bills turned up in the town over a month ago. Since then, the banker has been conducting a quiet investigation of his own, trying to trace them through their original source. He isn't sure, you understand, but he thinks Rostov and Markham are the men we're looking for. They have no apparent income, and yet they live well. Their movements are rather mysterious. It'll be up to you to investigate them, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I suppose in that country, it'd be best to pretend that I'm a prospector. A good idea. Will it be all right, sir, if I contact the banker? I don't see why not. And identify myself? You'd better. He may have some additional information. I'll get started first thing in the morning, sir. Good, and good luck. It was clear to King that afternoon that he and the sergeant were about to start on a trip. The sled was loaded with supplies, and in addition to the usual items, there were a pickaxe, a shovel, and the sort of pan the miners used to wash gold. 
The following morning, when King scratched the door of the sergeant's cabin and was admitted... Come in, boy. There was something strange about his master's appearance. <laughs> What's the matter? Don't you know me? The sergeant was wearing corduroy trousers, a red and white checked wool shirt, a buckskin jacket, and heavy boots. As King watched, he slipped into a bearskin parka and pulled the hood over his head. Don't you like my new parka? Well, this outfit will only be worn temporarily, boy, for the duration of the trip. Until we got enough evidence to make an arrest, I'm Bill Smith, prospector. Well, the clothes are all right. As long as we don't meet someone who knows us, we'll be all right. Let's get started, boy. The trip to Gold Ledge took two days. It was late on the afternoon of the second day when the sergeant drove down the main street. He stopped the team in front of the bank and went inside with King. The other members of the team crouched low in the snow. But suddenly, Old Faithful jumped to his feet. A huge man was walking down the sidewalk toward him. He was just about to pass the team when Old Faithful lunged toward him. The man was carrying a whip, and he began to beat Old Faithful over the head. He drove him back and still continued to whip him. The sergeant ran down the steps of the bank. Stop that! Try to bite me, will you? Give me that whip. Try to make me. I'll show that doggy kicker. The sergeant wrenched the whip from the big man's hand. This is your dog, eh? Yes. Then you'll take the beating he should get. <laughs> the big man charged the sergeant. For his weight, he was extremely fast, and there was no denying the power in his shoulders. One hammer-like blow caught the sergeant on the side of the head and turned him around. But he sidestepped the big man's next rush and lashed out with a right and a left that both hit their mark. From then on, it was a battle between brute force on one side and skill and intelligence on the other. The sergeant gave ground occasionally until the big man started to slow down. And then he took the initiative. He stepped inside a wild right and punished his heavier opponent with rights and lefts. The big man was unable to ward off the blows. A solid right crashed through to his jaw, and he dropped to the ground. For a moment, he lay still, and then his hand started for his gun. Get him, King. Oh, help! Get this dog off me. He's got my hand. That's because your hand was trying to get your gun. I'll take it. All right, King. There, it's empty. Now you may have it. Why, you... Careful. You want any more? You met your match, Bull. Might as well admit it. You better clear out while you can still navigate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gone. But I'll get you yet, stranger. Like my word. Hey, yeah, listen to me. The sergeant returned to the banker's office where they discussed the fight. You made yourself an enemy, Preston. I suppose so, but please remember the name Smith. Bill Smith. Oh, right. That was Bull Corbett. He's a friend of the men we've been talking about. Rostov and Markham? Yes. What I can't understand is why Old Faithful went for him. He's one of the best-tempered dogs I've ever had. Must have had a reason. Well, we saw it all. Bull didn't do anything to him. Old Faithful must have remembered him from someplace sometime before. The dog's first master was murdered, Harvey. Is that so? Do you happen to know, was Bull around 40 Mile about six months ago? Well, he didn't arrive here until three months ago. I see. Well, you didn't finish about Rostov and Markham. Yeah, their cabin is next to the El Dorado Cafe. I have no more information. My only suggestion is that you follow them when they make one of their mysterious trips out of town. I'll keep an eye on them. In the meantime, would it be possible for me to rent a cabin? Well, I'm afraid not. But there's a hotel. Bull lives there. Well, I want to keep an eye on him, too. Thanks for your help, Mr. Harvey. I only wish I could tell you more. You've been very helpful. Come on, King. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. The sergeant registered at the hotel. And that night he had supper at a corner table in the El Dorado Cafe. Just as he was finishing, a man with a scar on his left cheek detached himself from the crowd at the bar and crossed the room toward the sergeant. I'd like to introduce myself, stranger. Joe Mark. Bill Smith. Sit down. Ah, thanks. You seem to be generally acknowledged as a new champion of Gold Ledge. That's all? I didn't see the fight, but judging from your appearance and bulls, it must have been a clear-cut victory. Uh, perhaps I was lucky. Uh, perhaps. What are you doing here? Just looking around. Prospecting? In a way. Weather isn't good for it right now. I agree. Much better to take it easy in town until it breaks. Well, of course, a man must live. I'll have to find some sort of work. You got a fine team, Smith. You ever thought of hauling freight? Not only thought about it, I've done it. Well, I may have a job for you. Uh huh? What is it? A crate of equipment I had to leave down in Whitehorse. It weighs about 500 pounds. Will you pay a dollar a pound? Hey, that's steep. I wouldn't have any payload on the way down. 
Well, it's steep, but hard, I'll pay it. $500 for the trip. There's uh, only one thing. What's that? The crate isn't exactly in Whitehorse. It's hidden near the town. Someone will have to ride with you to make sure you find it. You? No, no. I can't make it, and neither can my partner, Rostov. There's only one other man. Could that be Bull Corbett? You guessed it, Smith. That changed things, any? Well, I can think of more pleasant traveling companions. But if he promises to do his share of the work, I don't mind. All right, then it's settled. When can you start? How about tomorrow? Fine. Bull will meet you in front of the hotel at daybreak. That evening, there was a conference in the cabin next to the cafe between Markham, Rostov, and Bull Corbett. Rostov, the bearded Russian, did most of the talking. Let me go over the evidence with you once more, Bull. The first stop he makes on reaching town is the bank. He might have had some gold dust. He made no deposit I have checked. He only talked with Sam Harvey. The next thing is his lead dog. I reached the scene of your encounter just as his master knocked you down. Just a lucky punch. Well, we will not argue. You went for your gun. He called to his dog, get him, King. Well, there are plenty of dogs in the Yukon called King. But so well trained. At the word of command, this King grabbed your gun on and shook it, making it impossible for you to aim or even shoot. This King has been trained as a police dog. Therefore, his master is a policeman. Uh, he's Sergeant Preston. You wish to get even for what he did to you. We give you the opportunity. Why do you make objections? But what do I get out of it? He's after all of us. Ah, uh, you're guessing. A guess that is founded on reason. Now, look. Six days to White Horse. Seven or eight back. Two weeks, Bull. You'll find a chance to get rid of him during that time. The gorge near Arkash is the ideal place. A blow on the head and he drops over the side. It is impossible to recover the body, so you load the case on the sled. What, and... uh, what's in it? Another printing press. Spare parts, we need them. You drive back here and report an accident. That's all. Maybe, uh, uh, why don't one of you do the job? The police have more against you than against us. They got nothing on me. Uh, if we were to tell them what about... What shot you... Look, I, I wasn't serious. Of course not. The job is yours because you are best qualified for it. You are the strongest bull. And you would like to even the score, would you not? Yeah. yeah. Then let us have no more talk. It is late. Uh, let's see. According to my watch, it's only 12. Your watch? Huh? <laughs> oh, I, I am sure that such a fine watch keeps excellent time. But 12 o'clock is midnight, and you must leave at daybreak. It is better that you get some sleep. Okay. I'll get him. You can be sure of that. The sergeant left Gold Ledge the following morning with Bull riding the sled. One king! One! The weather was clear and cold and the trail hard packed. They made good time, but there were no roadhouses between Gold Ledge and Whitehorse and they were forced to sleep in the open. Each night, as the sergeant crawled into his sleeping bag, he alerted King. Watch him, King. The great dog slept close to his master, and it was impossible for Bull to make any movement during the night without waking King at once. Old Faithful watched Bull constantly as well. He never tried to attack him again, but he always growled deep in his throat when Bull came near him. Once, though, as Bull looked at his watch, Old Faithful whimpered. The sergeant noticed it. That's a nice watch, Bull. May I see it? What for? It's after 12. Time to eat. Don't you trust me, Bull? Why should I? We'll uh, be at the cache by late afternoon. All we have to do is follow this gorge. It's your turn to get the wood. I know. Come on, Jim. The only trees were at the edge of the gorge. The sergeant picked up an axe and started toward them. As he went to work, King followed the canyon to the south, and Bull saw his chance. He's only a couple of feet from the edge. Hit him once, a push, and he's over. The sound of the axe made it impossible for the sergeant to hear Bull. The big man was directly behind him. He raised his arm to strike. King saw him and barked frantically. The sergeant instinctively dropped to the ground. The force of Bull's lunge carried him forward. He tripped over the sergeant, but managed to grab hold of a small tree as he lost his footing. Struggling for a better hold, his feet swung over the edge of the precipice. Help, help me! 
Oh. I'm supposed to save your life after you just tried to kill me? No, no, no. Deliberately, the sergeant took a pair of handcuffs out of his pocket and clamped them on Bull's wrists. And then he took a firm hold on his parka and pulled him to safety. What's the idea? You're under arrest in the name of the Crown. The charge is attempted murder. No, 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 you got me wrong. I slipped. Yes, lucky thing for me. Now I want to look at your watch. What for? Curiosity. Old Faithful seemed to recognize it, just as he recognized you. The pocket of your jacket, isn't it? Take your hands off me. Yes, here it is. Let's see if there are any initials on it. I, I bought that from a miner in 40 Mile. J.T., which could stand for John Taylor. Yeah, that's right. That was a miner's name. He was carrying the watch when he left 40 Mile for Dawson. I bought it from him before he left. You took it from him after you killed him. No, wait a minute. It's a nice watch, but it was a mistake to keep it, Bull. The charge against you is murder. I never... Save your breath. You're going to show me where Markham's equipment is cached. And I'm taking you to jail in Whitehorse. Get moving. <laughs> the packing case was found and loaded on the sled. Bull was taken into Whitehorse and turned over to Constable Downey. I'll start for Dawson with him first thing in the morning. And carry through on the case once you get there. Right, Sergeant. But what's to be done? Well, you'll have to make a trip to 40 Mile. There's a list of Taylor's friends in the file. They should all be interviewed. We'll need their testimony that Taylor was carrying his watch when he left 40 Mile. Also, we'll have to establish the fact that Bull was in 40 Mile. We must trace his actions before and after the murder. Now, that shouldn't be hard. What about you, Sergeant? I still have work to do on the counterfeiting case. You can tell the inspector I'm heading back for Gold Ledge. All right. That's a printing press on my slend. Rostov and Markham evidently intend to use it. I'll deliver it to them, and I'll probably arrange for someone else to transport it to their headquarters. Perhaps not. They may ask me to do it. If so, that'll make everything much simpler. Yes, but, Sergeant, when Bull doesn't come back with you, they'll be suspicious. I'm sure they are already. You believe Bull was acting under orders when he tried to push you into the gorge? That seems likely. Well, Rostov and Markham will try again in that case. I'll have their chance. Bye, Jim. Good luck. Same to you. It was eight days later when Sergeant Preston drove up the main street of Gold Ledge once more and stopped his team in front of Markham's cabin. Looking On schedule, Markham. Who is it? Hi, it's Bill Smith. The crate's on the sled. Want to look at it? I, I can see it. Well, fine. Come on in. Well, where is Bull? He met with a little accident. What sort of accident? Oh, he slipped and hurt his leg. Nothing serious. But he'll have to stay in Whitehorse for a while. Well, too bad. Or do you want the crate unloaded? Oh, not here. Uh, Markham and I have bought a mine on Tubit Creek, a few miles outside of town. We would like the crate to be delivered there. That'll cost you extra. Well, a few dollars. It does not matter. Man, what do you want to drive out there with me? Oh, it is getting dark. There's no need for you to go today. Tomorrow morning we'll be fine. Whatever you say. When will I pick you up? Well, uh, both Markham and I will be busy tomorrow. There is no need for either of us to go. You take it there first thing in the morning. I'll give you full directions. We have a caretaker who will take charge of the crate when you get there. Suits me. I'll draw a map for you. Huh. The way is simple. One takes the west trail out of town. It is four miles to the creek. Turn north there and follow it for a mile. Mm -hmm. You will see the entrance to the mine just before you come to a small woods. Oh, it should be easy to find. Oh, but of course. Here, here's the map. Thanks. I'll be on my way, feed my dogs, and get some supper myself. Now, you will be paid as soon as the crate is delivered to the mine. Fine. See you later. Why, Rostov? What do you mean, why? Well, those directions, they were right. And could there be any more secluded spot around here than our mine? It's the best place I know of. Bull has failed us. We must take care of the sergeant ourselves. You mean get word to Mike? I said we. Not only Mike, but you and I as well will be waiting for the sergeant when he reaches the mine in the morning. I wonder what happened to Bull. I do not know. An accident, he said. That could mean anything. Uh, he suspects us, that's sure. Of course. But he does not suspect that we know who he really is. He still plays a game, hoping to get evidence against us. Well, there's plenty of evidence at the mine. The plates, a small press... True, true. But such evidence will do him no good. He will never leave the mine alive. 
It was after midnight when Sam Harvey climbed the stairs to the second floor of the hotel and hurried down the corridor to the sergeant's room. Yes? It's Harvey. Open up. Hello. Come in, Sam. They've left town. Rostov and Markham? Yes, took the West Trail. I thought you might want to follow them. Do they own a mine on Two-Bit Creek? No. Is there a mine on Two-Bit Creek? An old one. It's worked out. What better place could they find for their operations? You think they've gone there? I'm practically sure of it. They know who I am, Harvey. They do? How did they find out? I have no idea. Are you sure? Bull tried to kill me on the way to Whitehorse. That was a fairly good indication. Tried to kill you? It was a clumsy attempt. He's in jail now, but Rostov and Markham don't know that. Tomorrow I'm supposed to deliver the packing case I brought from Whitehorse to the mine on Tubit Creek. They'll be waiting for you there. If they know you're connected with the police, you'll be walking straight into a trap. I'm starting right now, Harvey. The trap may not be set yet. But alone? There are two of them. There may be three. They mentioned a caretaker called Mike. Mike Benton, yes. He hangs around with them. You'll need help. It's my job, Harvey. I can't ask anyone else to take the chance. You don't have to ask. I'd rather go alone. But, uh... If I don't come back, I'd like you to get in touch with headquarters at Dawson. Preston, there are half a dozen men who would be Thanks, glad to... Thanks, Harvey, go. but I'd rather go alone. One king! One king! <laughs> the sergeant took the trail to the west and turned north when he reached the creek. Two miles farther on, he saw the opening of the mine, beyond it, the woods. The map had been accurate. Rostov wanted him to reach the mine. He stopped his team a hundred yards from the entrance. Okay, King! Hurry, Husky! One off! End of the trail, King! The dogs burrowed in the snow. The sergeant lit a small hurricane lantern and headed toward the opening of the mine on foot with King at his side. There were sled tracks leading past the mine and on to the woods. There were footprints coming back from the woods and entering the mine. The sergeant followed them into the main shaft. It led straight back for a hundred feet. King walked close beside his master. The shaded light from the lantern hardly reached the timbers that braced the roof. But King knew there were men ahead. They might be dangerous. The sergeant patted his head and King was reassured. His warning had been acknowledged. They came to a cross tunnel and the sergeant stopped. To the right, they could see a thin line of light showing beneath a door. The sergeant blew out his lantern and checked his gun. The sergeant stopped once more, a few feet from the door. He could hear voices. Look, Mike, you're mounting. Ah, you could be wrong. I'm sure. If you do not want to go to jail, you follow my orders. All right. How are you going to work? The sergeant had heard enough. <laughs> He kicked the door open and blasted the lantern from the table beyond it. Then he dropped to the ground close to the side of the tunnel as a volley of shots rang out from the guns inside the room. The sergeant held his fire. In the second before he shot out the lantern, he had seen all he needed to convince him this was a counterfeiter's workroom. The only problem left was to capture the men. He crawled forward toward the doorway. His hand touched a piece of wood. He threw it into the room. Three guns fired at the sound, and the sergeant fired at the gun flashes. Two of the men in the room were hit. The sergeant crawled back to King. Two of them, King. Done for. Markham! He caught me in the arm. I can't find my gun. Only one man who can still shoot. But he won't fire again, King. He knows it'll make him a target. I can't see him. It's up to you. Go get him, boy. The man with the gun, go get him. At the order, and without a sound, King began to crawl forward. He moved only a few inches at a time until he was inside the room. And then he stopped to take stock of it, by scent rather than by sight. Two men were lying near the far wall. One of them was moaning slightly. Shut up! The man who had just spoken was hiding behind something made of wood and iron, and the acrid smell of burnt powder told King he had a gun in his hand. This was the man the sergeant had sent him after. He must crawl around the object to reach the man, and he must do it so quietly the man would never suspect. Inch by inch, he moved toward him until he was only a few feet away. It was time to spring. Oh, 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 oh. 
Faster! The dog, it's King. Here you can shoot him. He's got my gun hand. He's twisting it over. As Rostov yelled, the sergeant entered the room and struck a match. All right, King, I've got his gun. Let him up. Stand up, Rostov. Is there another lantern in here? Yeah, there, there. There's one hanging from the roof. Light it. I'll keep you covered. Uh, you don't need to jam me with that gun. Move. All right, all right. That's much better. As the light flared up, King was standing guard over Markham's gun, which had slid under the table. The sergeant broke it, emptied it, and tossed it on the table. Mike's gun was in a far corner. This, too, was empty. And after the sergeant had handcuffed Rostov, he turned his attention to the two wounded men. I'm done for. No, you're not, Mike. I'll get you bandaged and take you into town. You'll live to do 20 years. What's the charge against this? Look around you, Rostov. Counterfeit bills, plates, a press, paper... There's another printing press on my sled. What's your guess? Well, the charge is counterfeiting, then. And accessory to murder. Murder? The murder of John Taylor on the trail between 40 Mile and Dawson six months ago. Uh, we had nothing to do with it that. It was Ball who killed him. We know nothing about it until afterwards. But you did know about it. You gave shelter to a man you knew had committed murder. Well, we will give evidence against him for the crown. That may help you a little, but you'll still go to jail for counterfeiting. How did you find out it was Ball who killed Taylor? Old Faithful told me. A dog? Yes. He belonged to Taylor, and he hated Bull. Why? The answer was simple when I found Taylor's watch on Bull. That's usually the way it is. The answers are always simple after the case is closed. Oh, 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 oh. In our next adventure, it was midnight as the Yukon Queen moved up the Yukon River. The quiet in the corridor on A deck was suddenly broken by a dreaded cry. Fire! Fire in the bush! In the excitement, a figure stood watching the door of cabin 102. As it opened and an old sourdough started out, clutching a small bag, the figure lunged forward. Get back in there, you. Let me out. The boat's on fire. Let go. Shut up. This will take care of you. When the old man in 102 was robbed during the excitement of a faked fire on A-deck, it seemed a hopeless task to find the guilty party. If Sergeant Preston and King find a clue and trail the crooks, they may face the guns of desperate killers. Be sure to hear this next exciting adventure. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. The challenge of the Yukon is brought to you every Saturday and Sunday. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye and good luck until our next adventure. This program came from Detroit. Today's most popular heroes of outdoor adventure are heard every weekday afternoon from 5 to 6 o'clock. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Mark Trail roams the wilderness, Clyde Beatty defies the beasts of the jungle, and Victor Borga entertains with five minutes of musical laughs. Tuesday and Thursday, there are the Indian hero Straight Arrow riding to uphold justice, Sky King zooming to supersonic action, and Bobby Benson, the cowboy kid, in tales of western daring. Listen to Mutual's Hour for Fun with Mark Trail, Clyde Beatty, Victor Borga, Straight Arrow, Sky King, and Bobby Benson over most of these stations every weekday afternoon. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. (laughs) 